Yep, so we're recording now. I'm okay. with everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Committee of the Lower Thames Crossing Task Force on the 14th of February 2022. Uh, please be aware the meeting is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Council's website. Number one, apologies to applicants. Um, Lucy, do we have any apologies to applicants? Yeah, we received apologies from Council Salmon, Council Farmer, Keith Ward, uh, and Colin, the Interim Assistant Director of Region and Case Delivery. Anyone else in here? <laughs> Number two, the minutes. Um, I move that the minutes of the Lower Thames Crossing Task Force held on the 7th of January 2022 be approved as a correct record. Are there any comments on the with the minutes? Agreed. Agreed. Number three, um, I have not agreed to any item of urgent business this evening. Number four, declaration of interest. Does anyone declare a declaration of interest? No. Um, moving on to number five. Um, first, I'll make a point of the evening. It's the National Highways Compensation Policy. We're allowed approximately 45 minutes for this uh, if needed, and there'll be a chance for members to ask questions at the end. I'm now going to invite uh, Chris Strutman. Before we go to that, Chair, what's the purpose of this item? Uh, the purpose is that we haven't discuss this in detail previously um, and uh, have a report generally about the compensation is going to take place if the MTC is to come to fruition and go ahead. So, so essentially this is merely a briefing then? Yes. I'm not quite sure why we even need to, to, to look at the briefing then. Briefing note is the first lady. I know it, um, but it is here and it is no, with the officers to I was talking about sure that I hadn't missed something. No. Uh, that's fine. Um, so we're going to invite Chris Stratford and Henry Church to introduce agenda item five. OK, um, can you all hear me? Um, Will. Uh, yes, OK, yes. I, I, I was only partially hearing it from the, your committee room uh, councillors, so um, Apologies if I missed that. Um, the the uh, compensation policy of National Highways, um, our briefing, if you like, um, comes in two parts, really. One um, we can discuss if you wish, but is contained um, within the Council's formal responses to the community impact consultation. Now, in that summary report and its appendices, Section three set out um, the council's comments on the um, effectively the non statutory compensation policy that National Highways have offered and the impact on the council's land interests. And that was in section three and in more detail in Appendix J of that document, which is on the council website. We can go into that if you wish, um, but that is almost historic now in the sense that we submitted it with um, council approval um, in the early part of October. Um, subsequently, uh, and obviously Henry and the CBRE team um, prepared that. Subsequently, um, Henry has produced with his team um, a note which you've been circulated um, in the uh, agenda today, which sets out um, what the formal compensation policies might be, and there are three types of them. And that note is intended just as a briefing note so that everyone is aware of how and if claims can be made and under which circumstances. So um, those are the two parts. I'm not proposing to go through the briefing note. Uh, Henry could, if you wish, summarise it for you. Would you like him to? Yes, please, Chris. Henry. <laughs> Good evening, uh, one and all. So uh, just to, to, to pick up on what Chris had said, what, what we're talking about in the briefing note is those instances uh, where compensation is payable to affected parties where no land has been acquired. I'll come back to that. The council does have land acquired in, in, in other instances and the, and the 
basis for compensation for that is well understood. I can talk about that as well if if, if you want me to. But but where there is is no land taken, there are three instances where where an affected party can claim compensation. The first one, in in no particular order, is uh, what's called, and we'll do this briefly, is Section Ten of the Land Compensation Act. It's the uh, so the Compulsory Purchase Act. It is known as the McCarthy Rules. Um, we don't need to trouble ourselves overly with the detail um, because uh, in 25 years of working with compulsory purchase, I've never had a case that's got through the McCarthy rules because the requirements to do it are so great. But in essence, is if you have a right that is impacted by the execution of the works, you can recover compensation. So it, it, in theory, if you lived up a if you if you had a house that lived up was up a track and you had a right over that track, and during the execution of the works, the building of the the, the the works, that right was interfered with, then in so much so far as the house that you lived in is worth less because you can't get to it for that period, you are entitled to compensation. And and of course that sounds entirely logical, but in that scenario, any acquiring authority worth its salt just provides you with an alternative access. Um and, and that largely negates the claim. The, the McCarthy rules, they set out four rules that you have to meet um, and, and meeting all four and actually showing there's any value attached to it is, is virtually impossible. So I put it in there for completeness. The second one is relates to the noise insulation regulations. So that is where a property is is meets the criteria which I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but it's very significant levels. I think it's 70 decibels. That is loud. That is very, very loud. Um, and with his, the property is within 300 metres of the scheme. Then the authority is responsible for identifying those properties which are uh, subject to that very significant increase in noise and has to offer either to undertake works to mitigate the effect, which is normally double or triple glazing, or provide funds for that work to be done. The, the, the authority will undertake that exercise and tell you who, which properties that you have are affected at a, at a point in time, generally uh, some way down the line. Um, but the, the caveat on that is the noise thresholds are extreme. Um, I mean, compulsory purchase compensation is nothing if not ungenerous. Um, and, and you do have to suffer from very significant noise. The, the third element and where perhaps uh, the greatest level of interest arises is, is under uh, what we know as part one of the Land Compensation Act 1973. That entitles the owner of an interest in land, which is defined in the Act, to receive compensation for the reduction in the value of their interest that is, you know, if it's a freeholder, your freehold interest in the value of your property caused by, and it's important, these words, the physical factors which are defined in the act as the, the noise, dust, smoke, light, fumes, almost invariably in this instance, noise, arising from the use of the works. So if you imagine a house that was overlooking green fields and now sits next to a dual carriageway, you would and you have a freehold interest in that you are entitled to the reduction in the value of that house caused only by the noise coming from that road the fact that you can see it not compensatable it's only the noise and, and it, insofar as light shines directly into the property that you are compensated for now i'd imagine that the council or its housing uh, whoever holds the housing stock will have potentially quite a significant number of properties affected in that way. Um, the, the timing of this claim is important as well because we'll all be a lot older before we actually get round to a claim because the claim cannot be made until a year after the scheme opens. So that is several years away, but um, it, it's worth noting that that, 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 that that compensation is available. So even where you let property, and you know, if you have a housing association that, that owns that property or it's council property, uh, you still have an interest because you have a reversionary interest. That is, you own the freehold. When the tenant vacates, you have that interest and it has a value and it will be impacted if noise is significant next to it. So those are the, the, the three very brief methods uh, of uh, where no land is taken. Laura, you put your hand up. Um, Henry, uh, you, you've got to allow the chair to operate. Sorry. So, sorry. Wait, wait yeah. for it. 
<laughs> yeah, that 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 does me briefly. Um, I, I just b before you before you go on, the, the one other question that Chris and I talked about is uh, is is how um, those who are affected by the construction might be compensated. That is, you know, I, I don't think you can underestimate how chaotic a road scheme can be. With all the best will in the world, roads will be closed. There will be signalling on on roads uh, and the uh, compensation mechanism is is non-existent for that. That is just bad luck. Um, it, it, that isn't satisfactory, I accept, but that it just goes with the scheme of things that, that you have to, that there will be people who will suffer, possibly quite significantly, uh, and they are by and large not compensated. There are odd occasions when people will be dealt with outside the main statutory provisions of compulsory purchase, um, if if properties are either very close to work sites, suffering extreme noise, or there is a very pressing need for the owner of a property to move, they might be dealt with. But that requires national highways to kind of offer, uh, exercise its discretion. And um, generosity is not a word that you find in its dictionary. Um, so in short, that's a very quick run through. You, you preempted my first question about when, when these become sort of flammable, so to speak. So literally nothing during construction unless you're literally sitting on one of the, the depots or, or the yeah, construction. Yeah, pretty much. Right. And well, would we have a rough indication of maybe how many properties in Parrot might be able to cover the statutory um, traffic noise and delay yeah, yeah. the stress area? I, I, we have a rough I don't know. It has hundreds. I don't um, I, know because I don't know how many properties you have. We have been going through an exercise, um, Councillor, um, with National Highways to identify all the properties within 300 metres. Um, if you remember, there was a, a one of the hatch measures um, was trying to ensure that the working hours related to earthworks only were restricted near properties to within daytime hours only and, and not allow the extended hours to operate. So we do have, um, well, they have plans showing exactly how many properties there are. I honestly can't remember offhand, but they have been identified and they are restricting just the earthworks working hours um, to normal hours, not, not, not extended hours that we have reached agreement and it will be secured in the DCO. Um, now we are still, as you well know, um, and Councillor Muldoney will be interested in this, uh, we're still awaiting any information about the updated noise and air quality assessments. And until we get that information, we don't know one, what impact there is, we don't know what mitigation they might need to produce, and furthermore, we don't know whether that mitigation is adequate to know whether any further claims need to be made. So that's all currently outstanding. And, and councillors, just to pick up on what uh, Chris has said, one of the difficulties that he and I have in, in assessing impacts is that the way that the development consent order process works is that most of the design hasn't taken place yet. So although they have an idea of how it will be built and what it will look like, there a, a lot will be left to the contractor. And so our task is to is to, to work with national highways to foresee those potential issues like the working hours and, and make them a requirement of the contractor. Um, obviously, we can't enforce the contractor to do it. National highways do that. But under un, under what's called protective provisions, these will be included in the development consent order and will therefore bind the contractor. Okay, thank you for that. I'll just get Councillor Muldowney coming, then we'll go to Laura. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Chris and Henry. Um, yeah, so at one point, I remember having a discussion with Matt Palmer uh, about a possible fund for uh, people who suffer from you know COPD or who are, who are extremely clinically vulnerable during the construction phase for them to be able to relocate either temporarily or permanently um, but obviously 
nothing else has ever been discussed about that, I imagine. Um, well, uh, we have um, reviewed us uh, when I first did the introduction, the, the original um, comments we had on what they term their non statutory policy. Um, we found that to be most unsatisfactory, frankly. Um, it didn't go much beyond statutory provisions. And so we are still, um, I suppose, hopeful, but certainly we'll be trying to ask them to improve that offer so that um, compensation during construction um, for noise, uh, particularly for noise, um, is in enhanced in their offer. Um, but that hasn't yet happened. Um, and it is it is quite challenging. That, uh, if if one if one looks at major infrastructure projects that are being developed in the UK at the moment, I, I can think of I can think of three that my firm has been actively involved with, and they would be High Speed Two, uh, the development at Heathrow, which is obviously now on hold, and Thames Tideway, which is a the super sewer under London. In each three of those schemes because they're not directly government or in some in, in many instances private sector they have offered enhanced terms um, over and above the the statutory bare minimum national highways do not do that they, they they their starting position is the statutory bare minimum if they don't have to do something persuading them to do it is very challenging does that help councillor um well uh, that explains it. It's <laughs> it not doesn't, doesn't, help, yeah, okay, doesn't, help doesn't doesn't help the residents who, as you say, it will be during construction that the um, a lot of the health impacts will be felt. And obviously, the route goes very very close, certainly within two hundred meters of areas of very high instances of COPD, and the highest rates outside of London. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like I'd like for there to be a fund, as discussed with Matt Palmer at one of our meetings, to look after those people. Yes, indeed. Uh, in fact, we, we did make 12 recommendations in our comments on the community impact consultation, um, part of which was that. So, um, and we haven't had any comeback from that yet. Um, so we'll keep pushing. Thank you. We'll wait for the Tim Action Group. Thank you, Chair. Um, Henry, I wonder if just for the sake of clarity for those that might members of the public that might, might be watching the recording of this, you could clarify. I know this paper was created for the council and their land and property, but that the points in it would also apply to general members of the public. Absolutely. So uh, so when I talked about the noise insulation regulations, that that applies to any any anybody who has an interest that is is meets the trigger um, within 300 metres of the road. So that will apply to everybody, not just not just the council. When it comes to the part one claims, um, that's for the noise arising from the use of the road. Um, again, that that applies to everybody. There are a number of firms who specialise in making claims of that nature and their modus operandi will see them will, is likely to have seen them mail shot um they normally hand deliver letters sort of encouraging people to sign up so i, I would be surprised if 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 those who might be affected haven't had uh, offers of assistance um already um of course the offer of assistance doesn't have to be taken up and it doesn't mean that there is a claim but it is you know it's a sort of quasi ambulance chasing type approach um, but there is no limit on, or it doesn't have to just be council property, it could be ordinary members or just members of the public. Thank you. And just going on to the first point, the McCarthy rules, yes. uh, rules that you mentioned. I know you said that you haven't come across that very often, but there are certain areas with LTs that I'm thinking where I know that there are properties where members of the public it, it doesn't fall within the development boundary, but their property actually butts up to it and it would affect their access on and off of their property. Is that potentially something that could come under that those rules or not? Uh, 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 absolutely, it, it could do. But but from an authority's point of view, the from National Highways viewpoint, 
it's quite easy to deal with because they can just simply provide an alternative method um, and demonstrating that um, a house with a slightly less good access um, is worth materially a different sum of money to that to one with an unhindered access mm -hmm. is actually very challenging to do um, re really very challenging um, I, I don't you know I have huge amounts of sympathy for people affected by schemes like this um, and, and on the face of it a number of people will be disadvantaged um, and there aren't mechanisms for compensating them so it may be possible, but it will be very difficult to likely prove it and be successful is what you're saying. Yeah, I, I am saying that, yes. I mean, there are I, I mean, I, just picking up on, on, on the councillor's comments regarding uh, people with with breathing difficulties and the like. If they own their house, if somebody owns a property uh, and it has genuine concerns, there is a mechanism under the Highways Act for uh, a person in that circumstance to make a discretionary purchase application. That is an application to National Highways to explain the pressing need for uh, them to acquire the property and for that person to move away. Um, again, it, National Highways don't dish those out willy nilly. Uh, I mean, the, the, the bar is set quite high uh, and there will be a lot of people who will be directly adversely impacted by both construction and subsequent use of this scheme. Yeah, unfortunately, we do know people already that have successfully been given discretionary. Yeah, I mean there were there Thank are some, there are some, but but the, but 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 it's not it, you you really the bar is set quite high. The, the, in, in general, people have to have have to have a compelling case, not just we don't want to we don't want to put up with it because um, if that were the case, most people would move. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a, a question off the back of that: the discretionary payments. Is there a, a cut-off point at any time, like when the DCO goes in, or when a DCO is approved, or or not approved? Is there a any time scale? On discretionary. Councillor, are you talking about on discretionary purchase? Yes. Yeah. Um, I. I don't believe so, but. Um, the, Part, part of the issue is if those circumstances arise, it, 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 it's prudent for somebody to act quickly because you have to make the application. There's all the hoops and bumps and jumps and whatever to get through to make the application. It then needs to be processed. Um, once the National Highways have said they will buy it, there then needs to be an agreement on the price before the transfer takes place. Those steps all take time. Uh, and, and if somebody is in that disadvantageous position, the sooner that process starts, the sooner they're away from the disadvantageous circumstances. Um, but I don't think there's any reason why it can't happen quite late in the day. I mean, they do happen. They're just not very many of them. I've got I'm dealing with one at the moment on a different road scheme, um, but you know, they're not that common. Thank you. Um, any questions around the room? Henry or Chris? Uh, I think that there's no more questions from inside the room. Laura, do you have anything else? Or? No. No, thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Chris, for your report. I think it's um, it's uh, quite frightening, really, some of the, the things that have, have come out of a, just a short discussion on this, on this briefing. Um, yeah, I just hope that we can uh, make sure the residents know and for our tenants know as well. What's, uh, what's around the corner, potentially? It, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Laura. Last moment. Check. Sorry, Chair. Can I just mention as well for anyone watching the recording, we have got some very basic information and links to places where people can get help. If anyone's watching, members of the public, and they want more on compensation, we have got some links and info on the TCAG website. So, Thames Crossing Action Group.com. Thanks. That's useful. Thank you. Thank you. Can we dip out now, Chris? Uh, you can if you wish, Henry. I've got to stay. OK, I will. Thank you very much for your time, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you get any further queries, then do feed them back to me either directly or through Chris. Be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.
Thank you, Herman. Thank you. Chris, agenda item six. Um, I think they know what you're going to say. But it's the verb update on health impact assessments. Well, um, you're quite correct then. Um, there is no further update, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, we're still continuing to push and ask. Um, there are various um, lengthy um, technical reports and emails outstanding on these issues connected with air quality, noise and health. Um, and um, we're continuing to chase to get responses. Um, as you know, um, we don't yet know if um, the next consultation is going to happen as was originally proposed. Um, the closing date for comments on it um, for local authorities was today. So we're hoping that we'll find out more later this week or early next week. Um, and um, we still don't have an indication um, other than later this year for the likely submission date. Um, so it's difficult to sort of backtrack from from the submission date to when we might get information until we know when the submission date is. Um, we are, I mean, the, the air quality and noise impacts are something that follow traffic modelling results. So we are awaiting fully updated operational cordon models and we're hoping to get those towards the end of the month. And it's only once those have been completed, can they then carry out the necessary air quality and noise assessments and hence health assessments. And that probably will take six to eight weeks afterwards. So we're not likely to get anything at all, I don't think, until probably early May. Um, sort of around election time, frankly. Um, uh, so we're still pushing them on that. Um, we still have a number of concerns, as you might know, um, about local traffic hotspots where they're likely to be um, additional capacity taken or delays ensuing as a result of LTC. But until we get these modelling results and hence do, do, do the other assessments, we just don't know, I'm afraid. I was, ex I was expecting that, but um, as this was the last meeting before, we'll know 100% of a consultation date, I suspect. Yes. I wanted to keep it on there just in case anything would change. I mean, could you give an indication of how much progress we've made say, from the last meeting a month ago? <coughs> I'll get um, answers. <laughs> Well, I suppose the answer is none. Um, we continue to talk. Um, we haven't actually got any results for the reasons that I've just explained. We can't get the results yet. Um, we do have regular meetings with the Community Impact Public Health Advisory Group, which all the local authorities affected attend. Um, we have those meetings about every six weeks. Um, and there is some information coming about how they're going to carry out various assessments, but we haven't actually got the results yet because they haven't got them themselves. So I, you know, I suspect for a couple of months at least until the elections are over, you're probably not going to hear much in the way of progress. Not, not that it's tied to the, it's not tied to the elections, it's just the timing, you know. Thanks, Chris. Um, I, thanks for sending out the document, um, the, the first draft of the health and equalities impact assessment. Um, yeah, that, that was started... a, yeah, that was a long document. It was not a draft. It yeah. was the original version one of the DCO submission. Right. OK. Yeah. So that was that was the full thing that went to DCO. Yes. One, which was the withdrawal. Okay, Indeed. yeah, I mean, I have started reading it. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's going to take me a bit of time to get through it. I mean, just just looking at it, I was wondering how they how they can come to a neutral impact on health in terms of climate change. Yes, well, I mean, bear in mind that I mean, that was that was written, but I mean, it was submitted in October and that document would have been completed 
uh, oh, three or four months beforehand. So we're talking about the middle of 2020. And at that point, the government hadn't really had its policy change drive about decarbonisation, climate change, whilst it was in the news, it wasn't quite so firmly part of government policy. Um, so it was probably based on policy at that time, which is why it needs to be updated. Right, OK, so you, you we, we might expect there to be a change in that. Well, I would hope so. I would hope so. Yes. Um, I mean, we're, we're Sorry. Neutral health outcome for air quality and sources of pollution and road safety. Yes. That's what they're claiming. Yes. Um, I mean, part of it may be historic in the sense that they need to update it, but part of it may well simply be that the bar that the regulations set for impact and hence significant impact, which then requires mitigation, is actually it's it's quite high and therefore achieving a significant impact you have to have quite an impact um, and it is set out in all the regulations that they're trying to follow so it'll be interesting to see how they get on with it yeah. um, the other question i asked because obviously our public health team analyzed it and said that by the standards and regulations that they used uh, which they were using sort of Rolls-Royce type standards. Um, they didn't feel that the standards that were used by national highways were actually good enough. Yes, that was the independent audit uh, of the methodology that uh, national highways used. Now that was signed up to, well it was written by Stantec, the company I work with, um, but it was signed up to um, and paid for by uh, National Highways, but it was signed up to by nine local authorities and scrutinised by nine local authorities. So when we submitted it, gosh, um, back in the autumn of last year, I think, um, their review of it, they are in, in their individual response to each of the items raised, um, I believe they have committed to um, adopting 80 or 90 percent of the recommendations. I mean, we haven't seen the results of that commitment, but that's what they said they were going to do. And we got that in writing from them. So when when it does get done, we can check it against what they committed to. But you're right, it 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 was um, there were quite a few methodological um, criticisms of it. Yes. Um, so maybe that's how they got to all these negative, uh, neutral impacts for things that... Well, maybe, yes, indeed. You know, seem to be having quite... seem will have quite an impact. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the positives for work and training across the board, um, obviously we've challenged that in different meetings. Yes. Um, because we're when we've looked at the detail, uh, there hasn't really been any commitment to providing work and training locally. Absolutely right. Yes, we've we've, we've asked so, them for, yeah. for targets, in fact, on all of that. Targets on apprentices, targets on local labour, targets on worklessness, <coughs> uh, a whole range of different targets. And I, I believe they're coming round to our view of that, because I think they see the positives if they could commit to it. Okay. The room, I have to hope they update it and do a better job. Oh, sure. I want to get the questions. Um, no, um, yeah, that's a check one. Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, Chris. Um, Hi there. My question is, I can't, yeah, I can't see you, councillor. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I can yeah. hear. You. Okay, thanks, sir. With the rising cost of things and the climate change, how much do you think this project is going to cost, actually? <laughs> well, 
Well, um, the cost estimate back in the statutory consultation, um, I think was about five to six billion. That was in the end of 2018. And that was in the back, the, the, the towards the end of the guide that they published at that point. Um, they have confirmed that the current range cost is six point something to eight point four billion. So you could argue that in the space of three years or so, the cost has risen by 30 odd percent. Now that that doesn't yet account for climate change because we haven't seen any evidence of that being built in. So um, it would be interesting to see what the final cost is. I mean, those are all published figures, so I'm not disclosing anything that isn't available. So you're quite right. Some of the measures, I mean, there are various measures that you can introduce during construction. For instance, the way you formulate concrete can be much more um, greenhouse gas friendly, if you like. The, 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 the um, equipment that you might use um, would um, HGVs, for instance, can be electric now. Um, some of the non road um, machinery that they use on site also doesn't have to be diesel. It can be electric um, and more and more manufacturers are producing that as standard. So there are lots of ways that they can achieve um, lower carbon impacts during construction. Um, the carbon impacts during operation relate to the car traffic. Um, and I think they're relying an awful lot on um, zero emission vehicles coming forward. But the Department for Transport's own estimates suggest that if there is an uptake and they are predicting an uptake of uh, zero emission vehicles, electric vehicles, if you like, um, that will increase traffic beyond what it was before the pandemic. So, you know, whilst there may not be much pollution coming out, there are there is more traffic coming because more people will t take up zero emission vehicles. So there's a bit of a long winded answer to your question about cost, but I don't yet know is the answer. But the trajectory of costs until you fix the scheme is always likely to be upwards. I mean, bear in mind that the DCO scheme is about 25 to 30 percent of the final design. And as Henry was trying to say, the, the the only way that we can fix what the contractors do is to ensure that various items are secured in various DCO documents, because when they start to upgrade the design from the 20, 25, 30 percent up to a full detailed design, we've got to ensure that it complies with the DCO. That's the purpose of the DCO is to force the contractors to stick to the rules, basically. Does that help you? Yeah, thanks. Okay. And again, um, from the first assessment of um, the carbon cost, the carbon cost, if it was uh, estimated to be costing uh, 150 million. But right now, the new estimate says it's going to be 500 million pounds is yes. going to cost. In yes. Value. yes. Do, you think, do you think that this project actually does it work? It? Sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Yeah, do you think that with the rising, rising cost of things now, you know, with um, costs and um, the road projects, do you think that, you know, this project is going to go ahead? Do you think from your own? Oh, gosh, that's a that's a hundred million dollar question. Um, <laughs> certainly, the, 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 the I mean, the, the cost hasn't changed so much. All, all that's changed in that 150 to 500 million is the government's method of assessing those costs. It's changed and therefore probably more accurate. Um, so what you're seeing 
is a more accurate representation of the carbon costs. How they're reflected in the overall cost, I'm not yet sure. And whether the scheme will progress, I mean, every indication we've had from government to date and from National Highways has been yes. But we don't, we, it, it's difficult to predict the future, really. Oh, thanks, Bruce. OK. Hello. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I was just going to jump in really and say about the uh, that 500 million, the 230 percent increase in the carbon costs is on the construction alone as well. The estimate is over a billion to clean up the carbon of the whole project sort of operations as well as that. So that's a huge amount. Um, and on the carbon issues as well, I've recently learned that there are three new legal challenges that are being brought forward by the good um, I'll write them down. Where was it? By Friends of the Earth, um, by Client Earth and the Good Law Project, and they're all based on carbon and the fact that the government had set the net zero targets, but the government haven't laid out clear yeah. indications of how they're going to get there. There's there's no actual strategy in place, so there's more legal challenges being moved forward on that grounds as well. And and the other thing with regards to um, the councillor's question about whether it's worth it, I think, as Chris said, that is the billion dollar question. But we should also bear in mind that National Highways have been very quiet and refused point blank to give us a figure of what the actual economic benefits of the project are. So if you're weighing up how much they're going to get out of it and what the so-called benefit is predicted to be, they've, they've been very quiet on that, which to me, if it was that good, surely they'd be shouting it from the rooftops. So I think that's something that is an interesting point to consider. Thanks, Laura. Any other questions from such a room? No. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Um, moving on to agenda item seven, the work program found on page 17 to 20. The agenda, does anyone have anything you'd like to add to the work program? Chris? Yes. You spoke about inviting National Railways along to an appropriate meeting. Was that any further forward? It isn't, it isn't yet and until we know for sure um, what they plan to do with their next consultation um, and I'm hoping that we might get something this week or next about that um, and at that point it would be suitable to invite them along. I should point out though that um, Colin will be here at I believe at the um, next March meeting. I will not be. I'm on leave that that it's that that week. Um, I uh, I hit quite a large birthday and I'm taking the week off. <laughs> Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Happy birthday. Yes. Um, so any members for anything the work program? Chris, could you circulate once you know about National Highways invitation status? Could you circulate that? By yes, of course. Circle? Yes. As soon as we know, I will make sure that we do that. Yes. Please put that down, Lucy, as an action for me. Yeah, I will do. Thanks, Thank you, Laura Blake. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, would it be appropriate to put onto the work program some kind of discussion about the council's comms in regard to LTC? I know it was mentioned previously that maybe we could have it in a future meeting for discussion and possible suggestions and ideas for the comms team. Is that something that we should add to the work program or just generally consider for the future? I think with a consultation looming and the calm before the storm that we know how, how these things go, that would be a good suggestion. Chris, would you like to comment on that? Or? Um, well, I know um, the council is in the process of reviewing its LTC um, website with a hope to um, make it much more agile and user friendly and informative. Um, not that it isn't, but it, it it can be made better. So I know the council is is investigating that, and it's 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 looking into the ways it can improve its um, customer service, both to residents and, and to measure the customer service standards that national highways produce on this particular project so those two things are ongoing as to whether they will be in a position to report on um 
possibly by the 14th of March. I'm not sure. Um, but, I'm but, quite happy to go for the 11th of April. OK. I we'll still be in conversation with that. I'd like someone from communications and all the media, to, media team to attend if possible. OK, well, I'll mention that to Colin. There is a new individual. Um, his first name is Mark. I'm trying to remember his second name. Um, and he has taken over from um, a person who's gone on maternity leave who was leading the comms team. Um, and he's here, I think, for at least a year. Um, so I'll mention it that he might need to come because, because he's closely involved in those two things I mentioned. Yeah, we can claim for the April meeting. That'll be, that'll be good, thank you. And Laura, you had another? Yeah, no, sorry, I was just going to, a couple of things on that. Firstly, would that be acceptable in PERDA for us to have that? Because I think April meeting falls into PERDA. And then just also to ask, in line with the comms, have the comms team, do we know, got any plans to do anything on the info events that are up and coming this week? And the whole farm survey and webinars that they've got coming up? I know that's you know, we're arguing that that's not part of LTC, but while national highways are pushing it as though it is and trying to mislead people. I'm not aware of any actions, Laura. Um, the person I'm talking about, by the way, is Mark, M-A-R-C, um, McGahan. It's M-A-G-E-E-A-N. And he's now, I don't know what his full title is, but he's head of comms to all intents and purposes at present. Um, could it be helpful for the task force to have any sort of suggestions and input while they're working on their plans of what to do to the LTC yeah. section of the council website? Yes, by all means, always helpful. <laughs> well, I was thinking but, rather than you saying they're not ready to give a report possibly just yet, maybe as, as a task force, we could discuss it between ourselves and see if we've got any suggestions to put forward yeah. to them before they come to us, if that's Could okay do. with everyone yeah. else, obviously. Yeah. Mary, Mary Patricia Flynn is the one that's on uh, uh, maternity leave and she's been um, replaced by Mark McGann who um, is there while she's away. Thank you. Yeah, I think if we can open break for and then we'll see next meeting if we need to um, see a course. Um, I mean, as far as I understand it, Councillor, the, um, the arrangements during um, um, PERDA are simply that whilst you can carry on with meetings, you can't actually make any decisions or you know offer any instructions is that correct I believe that in the past that's how yeah the LTC yeah. has been held in further before yes it uh, has uh, absolutely yeah um so we could discuss stuff like that um with a view to offering comments certainly as long as it doesn't get political and we all behave ourselves <laughs> yes yes i mean uh, obviously democratic services would have to advise on all this but yeah, it, it seems possible, certainly. Uh, Councillor Mulroney. Oh. Okay, I think that's the work programme done then. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this concludes the business of the meeting this evening. I'll now prepare the meeting to close at 18.50 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Cheers. Thanks both. Bye. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Now,